Desire to believe. Desire to believe. Do you have a desire to believe? I guess you can still see me, yeah. I can put it as simple. A straight simple. Whale. Every woman, every man, to me, seems to have a desire to believe. It's like any other desire, any imaginable desire, and any experienceable desire, such as the desire to eat chocolate cake. Or even more intense desires such as that. As to eat some juicy pussy. So too do people have a desire to believe. Basically, such a desire may seem to come out of the general desire to be correct. Humans are clever animals, and they are self aware about this cleverness. They are self aware of intelligence. You are self-aware of your own intelligence. And so, you want to be, you want to benefit by that intelligence. Now, intelligence isn't just like a fairy tale where anything goes. There's real intelligence, such as in dealing with carpentry. Such as cutting against the grain of the wood versus cutting with the grain of the wood. by its own intelligence. The human animal, in a way, 
reveres it itself for its intelligence. The human animal reveres the human species, the human genome, the human, uh, yeah, the human existence. Like something divine, as if it were something divine. And they worship intellect, smarts. They set up altars to icons who they perceive to be intelligent creatures such as Albert Einstein and some other Oppenheimer. These other brilliant, brilliant minds that have used their intelligence to solve difficult questions, difficult problems come up with solutions like the atomic bomb, or so the legend goes. And the atheistic worshipper of science holds such innovations as the atomic bomb as a sacred relic as an artifact of divine presence and divine uh, divine truth on the molecular and atomic scale. It is no different than than the average yeah worships an all-seeing one God that controls everything and says that there are no accidents and they hold the image of God, a bearded man on a cloud as their relic, their sacred relic, just this image, this idea of a one-eyed monster in the skies. blind, wrathful deity, indeed. But the Christian suffers just as much from the desire to believe as the average father or mother who believes their parenting technique is superior or in some way ultimate. Oh, the desire to believe, the desire to believe. It is a matter of superstition and gullibility and naivety in a way. One may mistake the child. Well, is it truly a mistake? To say the child is naive. For the child, with some intellect, tends to come up with fanciful solutions or fanciful ideas from what little they know, what limited knowledge they hold of the universe. And in some way, sparks of brilliance shine through the toddler's naivety if it is not so unhindered by their parents' deception. mother and father tend to want to believe that their tactful strategy of deception is the best input for the child's experience that they can produce as the most significant individuals in the child's life, the mother and the father. Anyone who takes up parenting, well, there are some who take up parenting with an innate passion, with 
uh, predisposed passion for child rearing and a dream of raising children and of having adventures, which parents can stage in some instances, in some instances, throughout the grueling torture of childhood, the parent can stage these instances of retribution for the child to make up for all the unpleasantries in one grand act of being the facilitator for some pleasant excursion to the zoo or to the aquarium or to the conservatory. It's all thanks to mum and dad. Is it? Or is it the desire to believe that mum and dad have? For what of those parents on each side of the parental spectrum having had parents or a lack thereof themselves and in the cases of lack such as children who are raised by single mothers children who are raised by single mothers where their father was just completely absent and any man their mother decided to fuck throughout their, their rearing of children they granted authority to whomever man they let into the bedroom to discipline or train their, their own children, these single mothers. And how betrayed does the child feel, does the son feel in this case, when he realizes that there is, there is a man-woman duality and there is a coupling effect of humanity. Humanity works in couples, as it seems. So they notice this with the various and assorted men that mother may bring home here and there, now and then. And what is the child of that woman to this man, to that man, whomever he may be for the moment, from time to time? weeks or months at a time or years coming in to a single mother's life, in and out of a single mother's life. And how does he treat the child? Well, it ain't his fault. He may be fucking his mother today. He may be motherfucking. But he is not responsible for that particular specimen, that particular progeny, that's some other dude's fault, and he apparently is nowhere to be seen. So how does a son often feel to be abandoned by his father? Uh, not often, but enough times that I've noticed he has a strong passion to desire fatherhood and to right the wrongs of his own absent father. And in a way he may assure that his own children avoid such unpleasantries as he did. But that is not to say that he is capable of excusing himself from all the trauma and the stress a child may feel. Of course, the, the parent is much older and much wiser. So they desire to believe. And when their grand explanations and grand lectures fail, when the child stand beneath what the parent tells them to. Oh, it's so, it's so easy 
to merely blame this on a lack of intelligence on the child's behalf. Oh, the child is simple-minded. The child is inexperienced. The child doesn't know what's good for him, what's better for him. being older and wiser does. So they desire to believe. But you won't regularly consider parenting techniques as aggressive as they are. Aggressive parenting techniques as some sort of superstition. I do. I think the idea that you have to be aggressive with your child and be restrictive, highly restrictive towards it, or even moderately restrictive towards it, excepting in cases of removing harmful influences from the child's environment. You know, the child doesn't select its own environment, and it never occurred to anyone, apparently, any house I've been to, to raise sockets above the toddler's level so that they can't stick their finger into it. It seems like these house builders placing sockets so near to the floor, for convenience sake, for sensible convenience sake, has not really considered what danger it may pose to the child. And of course, there's an easy fix in this instance, in the instance of, a, of an unused socket, which the, to, the toddler will rarely be able to yank a cord of even a toaster out of the wall. When you happen to have an unused socket, they have dud plugs, they have plastic plugs that you can insert into the socket so that nothing else can be inserted such as the child's finger so that the child doesn't prod and poke its way to an electrocution. That's just one simple way that a responsible adult can relieve or remove the potentially harmful factor from the child's environment. I mean, the child does not build its own home. The child does not determine where to live, whether to live in the north of Greenland or in the south of Spain. The child has no choice in the matter whether to live next to poisonous cobras or flocks of mosquitoes. No, this is all up to charge themselves with the child's care and often call themselves the parents. Well, I call superstitions as they are superstitions. Merely beliefs that are rather unverifiable because the child tends to resist parenting efforts no matter what form they take, parenting restrictions, the child will resist them, or in at the very least, to be determined to differentiate and to distinguish themselves. I've seen instances of bright, bright children who get along warmly with their parents and say they are just coming into adulthood, 18 years old. Yet, specifically rebels against the parent in a positive way. Say their parents are both potheads, such as I am. Their parents are both potheads. And their 18-year-old child doesn't smoke. Not a a doobie or a cigarette, not a spliff or a joint, or whiff of tobacco, nor does he drink. Not to say that the child is going to be better off than the parents, but 
this is one instance where he doesn't have an issue with them. He hasn't been so traumatized by them that he hates them or that he has difficulties with them. Maybe he can sense the, uh, the uh, uselessness of their habits and the costs, which include financial and physical costs, such as lack of cognition, lack of awareness, and occlusion of awareness, some, uh, going into the fog of drunkenness, or being high, or into the strange intoxication of tobacco, of nicotine, that I'm, <laughs> I've, uh, I haven't really seen what it's all about, so I don't really, having smoked myself, say, about 100, 100 cigarettes or less, much, 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 much less than 100 cigarettes, but I can say maybe that many, I don't get it, I, ne I never got what, uh, so great about the first huff. I, it is something, it is a particular, it is a particular reaction common to all nicotine smokers who feel a, that rush. And I can't even describe it because I've never re experienced it. <laughs> and the return and the, the craving to return to that initial rush on the first hit. Ah, that tobacco. And that wacky tobacco. So, sometimes, yeah, I don't know if Juno who was right, Lipschitz or not, but many children seem to desire to rebel against their parents in some form, in some way. So, parenting strategies are really unverifiable because they're really unverifiable in the cases where the child refuses to go along. So I call that a superstition. Well overspoken. Well over. I call that matter of superstition. Nobody knows whether their aggressive parenting, whether hitting the child, is actually good for the kid or not. Nobody really knows. They desire to believe it, just like they desire to believe that there's any valid information in their newspaper horoscope. It's. <laughs> A, it's a flawless tactic. It's a very, it's a, it is a tactic which has survived throughout the centuries. No, I don't know. As long as there's been newspaper, people have been buying into newspaper horoscopes that tell you what sort of day you might have if you are a Gemini or an Aries or Sagittarius or Scorpio. It, they list all 12 signs and have as much as three or four sentences in a little paragraphical blurb about what sort of mood, what sort of mood your day will be. Oh, you'll have a pleasant morning and then you'll run into trouble in the afternoon. Things that, you know, this is what basically the horoscope says. And people have des a desire to believe that there's any valid information in that. It doesn't matter if it's true or not doesn't matter if, well, say, maybe there is some, you know, there is one uh, or, or a number of accomplished astrologers who can give valid daily uh, readings, valid daily foresight, depending on the position of the planets and stars. So astrology in this sense, horoscope horoscopic astrology that is to say the predictive and sort of uh, I'm missing the word somebody who reads the future a psychic yes a psychic reads the future 
There's also the tarot reader, the palm reader, the fortune teller, the fortune teller. That's the kind. Ah, yes, the fortune teller has a way of giving a story, a particular narrative. Ah, such and such is the position of Mars and Mercury in your house, so that you must be mindful of your elders today, or to explore somewhere new this is calling for innovation, you know, making up some be bullshit, fortune telling. You're gonna have good luck today, you're gonna have bad luck today. Dare to believe that that's true. They have a desire to believe in horoscopic astrology. They have a desire to believe in horoscopic astrology. Just saying this in a few different inflections. It's the same with Gematria, which is Jewish numerology, which ascribes different meanings to the numbers. One means this, two means love, three means wisdom, four means... I don't, I don't actually know the system of Gematria, but they have different numbers. I'll say 19 is the number of the Goyim. And 21 or 13 is the number of the chosen people, or whatever, you know, these different meanings of numbers in Gamatria, Jewish numerology. And what are all those people who study that? What do they have? What's present in their psyche? What's present in their soul, in their heart, is the desire to believe that it's all true. They have the desire to believe that it's accurate and that there's valid information. Gematria, astrology, feng shui. They're not more than superstitions and contradictory or amatory expressions of these systems rather ought to be dismissed, rather ought to be scrutinized. If it weren't for the desire to believe, a person can test out gematria, or they can test feng shui, or tai chi, or vipassana, or yoga. They can test these systems. They can test the secret, the power of manifestation. They can put it to the test. And if they are capable of either remembering, I can't imagine that there might be not some documentation which they so readily consume, they'll readily consume someone else's documentation, but have they the patience to document their own experiences and to document their own results and to see if there's something to it or not and maybe in some cases there are maybe there are ways that you can produce results that are biased to you, towards your desire to believe towards your desire to believe in something and so too are mystics of the western world and of, of other worlds but people with mystical inclinations in a high capacity of intellect and problem solving they are intelligent people on their own right but they seem to have a desire to believe in their own created fantasies or their own created biases. Like they may have a bias towards a particular culture such as Haiti, Haiti, H-A-I-T-I. And they may believe that, they want to believe that the Haitian people are or that they have ultimate truth or truth that trumps or surpasses everyone and anyone else's.
such is the case with weeaboos or Japanophiles, people who are obsessed with Japanese culture. And they take up Shintoistic practice, Shinto practices, and Buddhist practices, whatever. And tea ceremonies, whatever Japanese form formality they perceive that may be being sold to them. It might be an exaggerated product that someone is trying to sell them. And they, they are, uh, well, maybe they desire to purchase that product. Maybe they desire to be a consumer in that product, in that belief system that the Japanese are superior. In any case, if I can offer a solution to this, it's not, it's not terrible. I'm not condemning you as if you were to have original sin. I'm not condemning you on something that you should be, feel guilty about. I only wish that you become aware of what you desire to believe and aware that you may have these obstructive desires in your way where you desire to believe something. It's like, if, if I could say it as in, a, in, in terms of destiny. In terms of destiny. Destination. Where are you trying to end up? If you want to get from point A to point B, and that's as simply as going from Appleton to Baltimore, And you want to do it in a specific way. So let's say you have this, this desire to take a road trip from Minnesota to California. Let's just be a little more specific. St. Paul to Arcata. And you really want to get there by road, by car. You, just, you preferably desire to get there by car. Well, you have other reasons for being there. You have some sort of destiny unfolding there, perhaps. But what if it, it passed your mind that you could travel by bus? Or by train? Or by plane? by some other method. Let's say that you could get there horseback or maybe that's the way you want to go. You're you're hell bent on getting from point A to point B on horseback for some uh, honorific ritualistic experience. Some ritualistic experience. You want to do it on a road trip or you want to do it on horseback. Yet it's unavailable or it does it proves to be a journey that you can't make such as you can't make it by horseback from Alaska to Russia Siberia or you can't whatever you can't you go by horseback or it is extremely unreasonable to go by horseback from Florida to California Well, you're going to be prevented from going there so long as you have a preference of method. If you have a preference for that method that is that is uh, insufficient, basically speaking, it's non-functional or it doesn't produce the results which you desire. Like you aren't able to get there because... Uh, there's an impassable mountain that horse can't go beyond, or whatever. Or that f fodder feeding the horse is an issue that is uh, in certain areas, certain treks of your journey. It's just unfeasible to get there by the, the means which you desire to get there. This is how your desire to believe might be impeding your ultimate journey because, well, I have to say that um, in terms of the hunch, 
the hunch must be brought to the test. I believe that's that is a more primal desire than the desire to believe, which is I say is superficial. It's superficial to have a desire to believe. Like say, I'm Cambodian. Oh, I desire to believe Cambodian way of life is superior to, you know, and maybe it's not superior. But I merely want to believe that it is. It doesn't help me. It doesn't enable me to improve. In the case of having the desire to believe. Yes, what I believe is more useful. What is more productive is having the desire to scrutinize to test things out especially your hunches and it feels exhilarating when you are on a hunch when you believe something or you have a working hypothesis of something and you're able to test it out you're able to manifest it or materialize it such as let's say a design for a boat. You have a new design for a boat and it's in your head and then you need to produce it on paper. Maybe not necessarily but it helps that way. It's standard that way especially in these days. You produce a model, a design on paper, a blueprint and you want to build it to see if it'll actually sink or float. Like You actually want to see if your fantasies play out in reality. You want to see that. It is it is the desire of testing the hunch rather than a mere desire to believe where you cannot test your hunch. And you can scrutinize anything. You can scrutinize Christianity. Of course, you'd be doing it wrong because one of the first rules of Christianity is that thou shall have no doubt But if you were capable of bringing a little bit of scrutiny to it, you may be surprised in how easily it deteriorates. How easily such beliefs fade away and such notions. And if you are an aged adult, if you were in your 30s or 40s, your 40s and you, you've had some experience in life of believing a certain way when you were 21 or 22 and believing that what you were doing was right and coming to find out through experience that what you thought was great wasn't all as chalked up as it was to be. Say you really wanted to join the Navy or you wanted to join the Air Force and then you end up joining and serving for four years or five years or eight years. And by the time your service is over, you've experienced things. You've experienced a variety of pleasantries and unpleasantries that debunk your initial hypothesis. And that's okay. That's part of growing up. That's part of development. Hell, I'm going through that myself. And no, it doesn't matter how wrong your parents were and how much better you were than your parents. And this is maybe where the strength of such desire comes into play is because parents seem to not allow the child to test their own hypothesis. It's very strange. Although you may consider it reckless for me to say, well, the way that anyone learns and everyone has experienced this, if they've ever been in, ex exposed to high heat flames or stovetops, that they're hot as fuck. And you may grab a pan. You might grab a burning hot pan and experience that. And you may continue to do that even if you know it's hot. Even if you have enough common sense to determine that it's going to be hot. Even if you have enough common sense to determine 
that, you know, how safe it is from a freaking pit or close to the ledge of a cliff. How close to the ledge of a cliff can you get? Sometimes you, you miscalculate or sometimes you just happen to be in the right spot at the right time. And ouch goes your finger. Burn goes your hand. You touch the flame. Everyone's done it. And are you here today? Can you look at your fingers and see, if you hadn't burned yourself recently, that they have healed in most cases? Unless you don't have any fingers to heal. I remember having burns on my fingertips. And I can look at it right now. They're not present now. They've healed. It's the matter of experience. And that is higher than per preschool taught authority. Anything that your parents told you before you were capable of going out and experiencing it in the world for yourself. What you can experience that way is superior to all that rearing, all that rearing education. So what I'm saying is that parents tend to squash the opportunity for the child to test their own hypothesis which may be outrageous it may indeed be outrageous at times usually it's just a matter of, of making a big mess in the living room or the kitchen with water because it's quite delightful water is such a contrasting experience and playing with a hose or pouring cups of water on top of everything it seems to the child like a very highly stimulating and highly uh, <laughs> highly rich experience it's a highly rich experience for the child to douse everything with water and yet the parent usually immediately stops this and almost in all cases assures that there is no possibility, there is no question that the child will even be capable of doing this. Well, of course, I say there's a way to provide a turn without exposing them to such ideas that'll be truly devastatingly harmful. Like, you know, your child is never going to want to just fire off the shotgun on the wall. They're not just going to want to do that if they've ever heard a shotgun blast. <laughs> uh, they're not going to want to tear down walls with a sledgehammer. You're never going to have a, an instance with a three-year-old or a five-year-old toddler suggesting that you tear down a, a wall I can see a broken window. I can see throwing a ball at a window and causing it to break. But beyond that, like, what? how much damage can the child do? And to be prevented from this for 18 years or more, it's like a torture. And what you see, what you can plainly see, is that the tendency is tendency of 18 and 19-year-olds. Not to say that every single 18 and 19-year-old will do this. But those who have especially been restricted tend to want to unwind and totally unleash themselves and let themselves go. It is like the first opportunity in 18 years that they've had to be reckless and they dive into it headlong. Many of them do, not all of them many of them do and I didn't at the age of 18 or 19 I did later well not much later when I was 20 throughout my 20s I certainly dove headlong into harmful and dangerous activity and I'm one of those children suck it up but I felt entirely restricted in my upbringing in by my parents that's just how it was it's it doesn't matter that say for example it's something that my father has regrets for 
being obstructive in that way and getting in my way. It doesn't matter. It happened. And it led me to that reckless streak. Overly reckless. You know, there's a way you can be reckless and preserve yourself. Well, I'm here alive today. I haven't lost any fingers or anything beyond that. I've damaged myself. I've damaged myself psychologically through my experiences. And many people do. You can't deny this of your own self. And how much of a struggle it was that you weren't able to discover something under your parents' supervision. And how easy it is to go ahead with that discovery process and probably for the better. The sooner you get it done, the better. <laughs> If that is such your case. Testing out the hypothesis is a stronger and more valid desire than the desire to believe. Simply that you have a hunch, you have an idea, you had some insight in your youth. It's, it's more like that, uh, that hypothesis that you can't test. Say your idea for a utopian paradise if only if everybody followed these rules whatever list five or ten rules oh then the world would be a better place and everyone would live in a utopia and they'd be satisfied and happy if they were to follow your five or ten rules as smart as you are you think that it's your capacity or your purpose to come up with a solution for everyone I'm telling you all you need to come up with is a solution for the self. That's it. That's what everyone needs to come up with. It's what I need to come up with. It's what you need to come up with. And they're going to differentiate and vary in countless ways. What is true inspiration is being able to see a man or a woman who has fully realized themselves and does what they do, they are able to determine their own routine and their own daily lives and their own actions out of their own faculty, out of their own sovereignty. They're able to do this. You can't list very many examples. I can't. But there are a few adults, there are few people, even children, who, who have achieved this, who are able, are self-determining and unregretful and happy with themselves and happy and confident and able to choose to select things that, that you know, making decisions is doesn't intimidate them in life. And whatever consequences they have to live with, the choices of life, that's the one thing. Whatever you choose, there's going to be consequences. So, pick something. See how the consequences are. If they're too much, pick something else. Decide something. Make a different choice. If what you chose first has too grave a consequence, pick something else. Decide something else. Maybe the consequences won't be so bad. But if you can get to the point where what there are always consequences, pa. What a false desire to escape consequence. You cannot escape consequence. If you eat a donut or enough donuts every day, you're going to get fat. Simple reality. No one escapes that consequence. And, okay, so some people have higher metabolism. But that doesn't mean they can eat anything. There's consequences to everything. So you're never going to escape consequences. The maturity is in when you can accept the consequences that you've chosen for yourself and that which comes to you inconsequentially there are some things that are just they're ne they are neither consequential nor inconsequential such as uh, hunger <laughs> the desire to eat that affects almost everyone the desire for sustenance to keep on going so that you can reach your other desires that you can formulate and reach other desires. Not formulate, but visualize and verbalize. And also within this process, genuinely 
reap the benefits of reaching towards your desire. Reap the benefits in a cognitive sense to be to recognize success, to recognize what success is, and to reap a satisfaction out of it. And not just a bland satisfaction, but a soothing satisfaction, a pleasant satisfaction. And that especially of yourself, to be satisfied with yourself, to be pleasantly satisfied, and maybe even impressed. So there is a desire to believe which is pathetic, it's superficial, to test your hunch out, your hypothesis, and if you're thwarted, if you're incapable, if you do not have the opportunity to test your hypothesis, you either need to come up with, an hypo with a simpler hypothesis that you can actually test out immediately, tomorrow, you can actually go ahead and do it and discover the real, you know, whether your design for a boat will sink or float. And that. I personally believe I've got this hunch. And desire and you desire to know what is true truth and you desire to live in a particular truth say all pork hot dogs you Desire to live in a reality where that's the case. That is the case. And they aren't putting some other fodder. Or they aren't misrepresenting what you believe. Or what they're presenting about their product. That you're consuming. Correct. You have a desire to be right. And that is okay. It's more than okay. It is... It is a, it is an ever-present, organic motivator. You're not just a robot that wishes to compile data. You're not just a robot that wishes lifelessly to compile data. You have a desire to be correct in a way that affects your mood. It affects your soul. In a way that you can feel bliss or satisfaction and harmony when you do come to what is right, when you discover what is true and what is factual, when you reach those discoveries. You can reach those in. You can reach those in pseudo official ways, fake ways. You can fake it. You can reach a fake. Reality where what you thought was true ends up being true. Such as uh, the idea of healthcare. It is broad. People's various solutions. It seems, it seems almost that everything is a solution for anything. That someone may tell you to rub yourself with essential oils like tea tree and whatever. And someone may tell you, tell you to rub yourself with sand. And then another person may tell you to soak in a swamp. And someone might say, get sunlight. Another person may say, get moonlight. One person may say, drink green tea. Another person may say, drink chamomile tea. Why? In these cases, say, take, say, take chiropractors or aromatherapists, they too have a desire to believe that their medicine is absolute, that they hold a panacea, which is kind of ridiculous. You don't necessarily need a panacea if you have enough cures 
for whatever various ailments you can have. There are few ailments. There are few real ailments in human experiences. Digestive ailments, including constipation or diarrhea, respiratory, mucosal, nostril, eyes, ears, hair, skin, <laughs> sphincter, genital, toenail. There are, there are very finite ailments that a human can experience. So it's not unreasonable that you can have a different solution for each one. However, for simplicity's sake and for convenience sake, if someone happens to be, say, a butter farmer, well, maybe butter will be the solution for everything. Just put butter. Just add butter. Rubella? Butter. Chicken pox? Butter. You know, it's it becomes rather a convenience and a profit desire. Like, desire to profit off of what is readily available to you by marketing it as a cure-all panacea that just fixes everything. And you desire to believe this. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. It doesn't matter if the the folks whom you hand this medicine out to and charge them for actually heals themselves or not. That that doesn't matter. So long as you maintain your desire to believe. Forget that. A desire to believe is specific, by the way. So I was just saying, well, that's just, you can say, I believe that m lion's mane mushroom will cure anything. And I can believe that. Maybe I can find access to it. I can hand people and say, eat this. You shall be cured of all your ails if you eat this. Reminds me of uh, the wounded Fisher King, whom the, gr the company of the Grail gave at least a dozen or more solutions, such as the blood of a pelican, and waters from the rivers that flow out of Eden, and uh, such a root or such a fruit or whatever. They, they gave him literally dozens of cures, and each of them did not work. doesn't stop the seller of the cure it doesn't stop the promoter of the cure from giving it out because there's already a system evil effect comes into this strong so long as they can convince that the placebo is whatever they are selling that it that puts you in a relaxed sort of state. You don't have to relax. You don't have to worry so much about money. You have to worry less about money, so long as your product or your service can sell. Whether you have high marketing for it. Desire to believe, like a desire specifically to believe in gematria. Like I've already said a billion times here. true. I'm going to make that broad assumption and say, all you desire, really, is to know truth. And that word, as profound as it may sound to you, is quite blank. The word itself doesn't tell you what is true. Investigation you need to process. No one else can do the investigation for you. You have to determine what's true, what is untrue. And the odds or chances are stacked against you because there is so much deception. And that may be one thing to be aware of if you've ever been deceived or lied to. That there are many forms of this and people don't even have to know you very well. And they can even carry on a life of 
pretending for months. I've seen an instance. I've met a man. I have met a man who conned my friend by pretending to be his friend for months. Business partners, and at the ripe moment, he stole everything from him and skipped town, unable to be traced, unable to be punished. Sometimes, you know, you can't, you're not, you don't really get along with your friends if you suspect that they're going to backstab you. No, you have to de you have to desire to believe that they are honest friends and that they would never hurt you and that you also would know otherwise you'd be able to detect and it goes more towards your credit so long as you have this desire to believe that your capacity to scrutinize has delivered it's produced results that are acceptable explain this except for in the situation of a diner or a restaurant if you were to sit down and take a glance at the food your server brings to you server brings out a nice pie or a nice looking pot pie on the outside you drive your fork into that pot pie it looks nice on the outside but as soon as you take that first bite you find it is not to your liking you find it is too soggy. Yes, it's too soggy. The texture is unpleasant. It is like chewing on swamp goo. Initially, the results you might see, such as getting the pie on the table, it looks good at first until you're able to dig into it. It just seemed to work out. Someone, you'll select a wife or you'll select a spouse and they'll seem like, oh, yeah, yeah, they are uh, great. We're going to get along just great. It seems like that in the beginning, doesn't it? <laughs> superficial validations to your desire to believe and in any case it doesn't matter what evidence or facts someone brings to you so long as you hold the desires to believe alone everyone's plagued by it Muslims especially that Allah and Muhammad is nothing but the word of truth. Thanks to this desire to believe they have no other desire to scrutinize. They have no desire whatsoever to question or to investigate or to cross-reference. Nope. That would interfere with their desire to believe. They want a simple life of having already acquired mystical illumination, which is actually quite ridiculous. It is a lifelong journey and one that is not tiresome. Once you get on to a vein of what is truly divine and what is truly mystical and magical about experience itself, about reality, it's not a tiresome or weary experience to go throughout the decades and to evolve and to acquire and to come up with new and pleasant harmonies with your environment. Some people are sold on convenience. Some people have the threat of violence to consider. Or the threat of excommunication. They don't want to be kicked out of their Christian or Muslim community if they were to behave in any questioning or doubtful manner. No, it would ru it would spoil the game. It would spoil the experience.